Well, um, today we are launching a new series for the next couple weeks, six weeks or so, um, and we're going to be looking at the book of Ephesians together, and I'm excited. I love the book of Ephesians. Um, we're going to be just jumping in every week, looking at a different chapter, so if you kind of want to spend the next couple weeks just reading Ephesians, diving into it, we're going to be talking about it every week. Um, but I'm going to give you a little context of, of the book of Ephesians, and then we're going to jump into chapter one. Um, but Ephesians is a, a handwritten letter from the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus. Um, it was written from prison, and it was written somewhere between like 60, 62 AD. And um, it's this a, a letter of encouragement to the church in Ephesus, and it's a um, it's such a powerful such a powerful book. Um, there's so much in it, and, and Paul has, you know, this really great relationship with the church in Ephesus, and kind of like in, in Paul's ministry there, there was constantly either a riot or a revival taking place, and um, so there's this rich history, and, and Ephesus, this city that's receiving this letter that we're going to get into, it was a really unique city. It was a unique, um, a unique region. Um, because, first of all, it's a very urban area. Um, it was a port city, and so there was a lot of trade and traffic and, and um, just a very significant and influential city of its day, and in fact, some regard it as one of the most influential of its day of that region. Um, it also was, Ephesus was also where there was, you know, um, kind of the headquarters of pagan worship. There was a, a giant... Um, well, it was really just centralized, a lot of the, the pagan worship um, there. And, um, you know, there was a big, famous, you know, pagan temple dedicated to the, a Greek goddess and that kind of stuff. Um, and so it was really significant. It was a, a key place for evangelism. Um, the church, the community, um, and, and the people of Ephesus were, were very much seen as like movers and shakers. They were people who got things done. They were um, powerful powerful people. And, um, and so I love this book and this message that, that Paul is writing to the church in Ephesus because it's full of themes like identity, of authority, um, understanding who we are. It's, it's, it's both like faith and practice, like, you know, how we walk out powerful living. Um, it's, it's an incredible book. It's, you know, maturity and how to live victoriously, all of that. And so I'm excited to, to jump into these themes together. But something that's also, also interesting, um, just for some context before we jump into this, is in Revelations, you might remember, where the Lord writes a letter to the various churches, the various regions. And, um, you know, and it's this um, encouragement for what they're doing right and challenge for the areas where they've kind of missed it. And there is a particular, um, you know, section where um, the Lord, the angel of the Lord is speaking to the church in Ephesus. And so it's interesting um, because there's some really positive things um, about the church, but then there was also one really serious warning. So I'm going to actually start there. Revelations 2, 2 through 7, we have it on the screen. It says, um, I know all that you, this is from the Lord to the, to the church in Ephesus. I know all that you've done for me. You have worked hard and persevered. I know that you don't tolerate evil. You have tested those who claim to be apostles and proved that they're not, for they were imposters. I also know how you bravely endured trials and persecutions because of my name. Yet you have not become discouraged. But I have this against you. You have abandoned the passionate love you had for me at the beginning. Think about how far you've fallen. Repent and do the works of love you did at first. I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place of influence if you do not repent. Although to your credit, you despise the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also despise. The one whose heart is open, let him listen carefully to what the Spirit is saying now to all the churches. To the one who overcomes, I will give access to feast on the fruit of the trees of life that is found in the paradise of God. So what's interesting is the church in Ephesus, you know, they weren't just an active church. They were known for their labor. They were known for, for just their, their toil. They were excellent. They were excellent. They were producers. They got stuff done. 
Um, and when you hear this, they, you know, when you kind of dig into this, they took a big stand for justice. They took a big stand for righteousness, and they were persecuted for it. They stood up to what others culturally were okay with. The church in Ephesus was like, no, right? And even that passage where it talks about the um, Nicolaitans, you guys know who they are? Totally, right? Y'all remember the Nicolaitans? <laughs> Just kidding. Um, and so apparently the Nicolaitans were a group who followed a guy by the name of, of Nicholas, shocker. And um, they were people who believed in God, professed faith, but they had mixture and Nicolaitans were actually known as a conquering people, which is interesting. They mixed faith with a lust for power. They mixed faith with political power. Interesting. And God says, to your credit, you despise the practices of these folks, as I do. Right? So the, the church in Ephesus, they're powerful, they're dreamers, they're influencers, they're movers and shakers, they're people of justice. Um, but then, and they're this influential city and all of this, right? But then the one thing the Lord challenges them is he says, you've done all this great stuff. Be careful, though, that you don't lose your first love. Be careful, though, that you don't get so busy and so caught up. Everybody in, you know, in Ephesus, all the church was doing great things for God. But be careful in the midst of being excellent and doing all these things. You don't forget your first love because you'll lose it all. Interesting to me because when I was reading a lot of this, I was like, huh, Ephesus feels a little like L.A. <laughs> Just a dad. Interesting. Interesting. And so I I'm excited for us to dive into this passage together because this letter from Paul to the church, I think is going to really bless us and encourage us and strengthen us in our own journey in our own region, in our own pursuit, um, as we dive into some of these, these concepts. And, and my prayer is that we would, we would grow in our, our identity and our authority, but more than anything, that through this, that our first love would be rekindled and that we would be so passionately in love with Jesus more than anything else. That love would not go cold because, cold because you can do all the right things and be doing all the great things and have really good theology and be living right. But if your heart is not awakened in love, what's the point, right? And so that's my prayer for us um, as we kind of embark on this journey. All right, well, we're going to just jump in and read a whole chunk of scripture. Y'all ready? You can handle it, right? Yeah. One person. One person can handle it. All right, well, the rest of you... Hang on. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in, in Christ Jesus, grace and peace to you. Again, right? I love that. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the Lord. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us. Can we just say chose together? For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption. You have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Verse 11, in him we were also chosen. Say it again, say chosen. In him we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, 
the gospel of your salvation, when you believed and were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance into the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, I've not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray that the eyes of your heart might be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he's called you, the riches of his glory and inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fulfills everything in every way. Whew, that's good. That is good. We're going to dive into that. Before we do, I want to tell you a story. Um, When Hone and I were dating, um, we, you know, for me, I was really wrestling with, is this the one, right? Is this the one, God? I don't know. Like, is this the one? And um, because of my own um, fears, I didn't want to get it wrong. I was like, you know, I came from a broken family. I was just like, I don't want to get this wrong. I don't, I don't know that if I trust, I don't know if I can trust my own judgment. This is way too heavy to like get wrong. And so I was like, God, I just need you to tell me, actually, I just going to need you to command me to marry him if he's the one. That's exactly what I told the Lord. Just command me to marry him. Like, just tell me, marry him. And that way I'll just know it's you done. Like ride it in the sky. Like, just tell me to marry him. And God was like, you offend me. (laughs) He did. I was like, no, I need you to just tell me, right? Because when it, it, you know, when it gets hard, I wanted to be able to go, this man, you made me marry. No. Um, I was like, God, I, I need you to just command me to marry him. And God is like, you know, begin to break down to me why that was so offensive to him. And he began to tell me, I'm the God of choice. Because I'm a God of love. And I would not be a God of love if I didn't value choice. And he began to challenge me and say, hey, I think it's a good good option for you. But this has to be your choice. You have to make the choice if you're going to love this person for the rest of your life. This is your choice, right? And um, and it was like, "Ah, that's like, you know, a weighty choice, you know, but it was so freeing to make that choice. But I understood something that day about God that I had wrestled to understand before. And it's this power of choice. It's this power of, of without choice, real choice, free choice, there's, there cannot be real love, right? And, or real freedom. And so, I love that this whole chapter, this whole, you know, chapter one of Ephesians is all about choice, and it's all about the fact that you are chosen. You are chosen. And that's actually the the title of my sermon today is Chosen. The word chosen means object of choice or receiver of divine favor. I love what is said here because it says that we were chosen um, not just before we were born, but before the earth was created. You were chosen by God to be adopted into his family before the earth was created. Before you could try to impress him. Before you could try to show him how cute and adorable and wonderful you are. Before you could sin and make a mess, before you could do anything, he chose you, like chose you, adopted you, brought you near. I love in verse 5, it says, 
In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Because of his love for you, you were predestined, preordained. We'll get to that word in a minute. If you're like, oh God, here we go. We'll get to that in a minute. But I want you to, I want you to, to think about this concept that you, that there has not been a day of your life, not a moment, not a second of your life where you were not loved, wanted, dreamed of, planned for, provided for, thought of, passionately desired, covered, looked after, or belonging. There wasn't a second of your life where you didn't belong. It's powerful. We're chosen in God. You have been destined from before the creation of the world to be adopted as his, wanted in his family. It brings him great pleasure. Right? Before we could make mistakes, he chose us. Because it's not about us. It's about him. It's not about our nature. It's not about something we've done or maybe we'll do for him one day is why he chooses us. No, he chooses us because he is love, right? And if it's not dependent on you, you can't lose the choice. Because you didn't earn it, you can't lose it. Because it wasn't, you didn't get it because of your behavior, therefore you can't lose it because of your behavior. He chooses you. From the beginning of time, you have been in the heart of God. He has dreamed about bringing you into his family and walking closely with you. You were designed and created with great intention and purpose and love. It's who he is. He is love. He is family. He is acceptance, right? He is inclusive. He is loyal. He is relational. He is infinitely kind and good. This is who he is, and that is why he made you. His only thoughts towards you have always been love and that you belong and that you're wanted and that you're chosen for great things. That's powerful. You are his will. You are his pleasure. Destined to belong. I, I want to tell a, um, a quick story or, or a, more of a, an experience. Some of you guys have heard me share this before. Um, but uh, when I was in college, um, if you know, some of you know my testimony, I grew up in a Christian home. I had an encounter with Jesus when I was two years old and I loved him ever since then. And... Um, in college, I'd had this experience where I was, I was praying and I was actually complaining to the Lord and telling the Lord, like, oh, yeah, my testimony is, like, so lame. Like, oh, like, and I wanted, like, some crazy story, you know. I was, like, lost as could be, and Jesus showed up, and, you know, and I wanted some wild testimony, and I'm, like, I actually don't remember a day that I didn't know you, as if that's not amazing, right? But, um... I was complaining, and, and I was in this place of prayer, and I just felt like the Lord said, I want to show you how I see your story. And I began to have a, a vision. I don't really know how to explain it. It, it. it didn't see it in front of me, but it was like in the, my mind's eye, right in the image center and my spirit as I just was there with my eyes. So I began to see this whole thing kind of play out. And I saw this picture, and it looked like um, me as a little girl, and everything was in black and white. And um, I was chained with, like, millions and millions of people, right? And it, it was, like, obvious that we were slaves or something. And we were all just, like, walking. It was this horrific, gruesome scene, like, just so sad. Like, we were all walking. And it was like I knew we were walking towards our death. And um, all these people just sad walking. And I was this little, you know, saw myself as a child. And um, as we were walking, we passed by this beautiful castle. And... My heart just began to leap. I, don't, I didn't know what was behind those walls, but the castle was actually in color. And it was just like, I, I didn't know, but I was so drawn. And then out of the castle doors 
steps um, this man, which now I know after this experience was Jesus. And he was just so kind. I just was so drawn. He just felt so safe and kind and loving. And I just wanted to be near him. And I remember this in this picture, like my heart pounding, like, I want to be near him. I want to be by him. And, you know, it was like, how will he ever see me? I'm in this ocean of people. How will he ever see me? How will he ever find me? I'm just this little tiny kid in this ocean of people. And then Jesus just began to walk through the crowd. And he kind of was getting closer and closer towards me. And I was like, could it be? No, there's no way. And he got closer and closer. And he came right up to where I was. And he got on his knees. And he looked me right in the eyes. And he said, you. I choose you. I want to be your daddy. Do you want to be my little girl? In this experience, I was like, <laughs> yes. You know, I knew I was like an orphan and a slave. I don't know. It was all the drama. I love how God speaks to us in ways that we need to hear it. Okay, so guys, some of you men are like, wow, that is definitely the female version of how God would speak to me. But whatever, listen, okay? He speaks to me in a way I understand. And, um, and in this experience, he breaks the chains off of me and takes me into the palace, into the, the kingdom, and it's just... I was so in this experience, I just couldn't stop taking in. Everything looked different, smelt different, felt different. It was so different. It was so colorful and vibrant and, and just was so wildly different in there. And I, I wanted everything. I was like, I just, I want this world. And, and I remember being taken in and, um, you know, these servants took me off and bathed me and, and brought me back out and this beautiful dress. And I was standing before the king and he said, um, there's something we need to get clear today. And he, he gets on his knees again. He looks me in the eyes and he says, today I'm adopting you. Not kind of adopting you, totally adopting you as my own. Because of that, you're no longer allowed to think like a slave or talk like an orphan or act like a, a slave and an orphan. That's not who you are. You are royalty. You belong with me, and you belong here. And he said, put out your hand. And in this experience, I put out my hand, and he put a key in my hand. And instantly, it was one of those things where I don't know how to explain other than instantly I knew that the key represented faith. Because what I'd seen when I walked in was ha hallway after hallway, like endless hallways, and each hallway had endless doors on both sides. And I just somehow knew that behind every door was like a world of its own. It was like all the creativity you could ever need is in heaven right now, right? All the wisdom you could ever need is in heaven right now. It's in God. It's in the kingdom. All the peace you could ever need. God does not lack anything, right? It's all there. Healing, everything is there. And I was like, oh my goodness. And I understood in that moment, by faith, if I used that key of faith, I could open up every single door in the kingdom, I lacked nothing, but it required faith, right? Have you noticed when you read the Bible and you hear a promise, you're like, that sounds great, but it just doesn't magically appear in your life? You have to activate it by faith, right? And so in this experience, you know, I just, of course, began to weep, and I was just like, that's beautiful. And God's like, this is your story. This is how I see your testimony. And I wanted to share that because that's all of our story, that's exactly what Ephesians 1 is telling us. This is our story. We have been chosen. We have been adopted. We have been brought into a whole new kingdom and given access to everything. We are loved, we are wanted, and we get to learn how to not live like orphans and slaves anymore because that's not who we are. John 17, 23, Jesus is praying for us, and he says, you live fully, and he's praying to the Father, you live fully in me, and now I live fully in them so that they may experience, will experience perfect unity and the world will be convinced that you have sent me for they will see that you love each one of them. Listen to this. With the same passionate love that you have for me. Do you believe God loves Jesus? The Father loves the Son. Two people. Y'all, we got to do better than that. Do we believe Father God loves the Son? Okay. What does this tell us? You love them with the exact same passionate love that you love me. Jesus is praying this. Jesus is saying, guys, 
the same way that the Father loves me is the same way that he loves you. That's pretty wild. That's pretty wild love, right? Think about those implications in your own life. You know, in fact, his son was punished on our behalf, and we got his reward on his behalf. God knows us. He sees us. He loves us. He chooses us over and over again. And you, whether you run from it or not, are marked and set apart for God. You always have been. So I want to go back to that word, predestined, for a minute. We're going to totally solve this this morning. Just kidding. Um, You know, the best scholars and minds and theologians have wrestled through this concept, you know, forever. Um, And here's what we know. We know we don't agree, okay? That's what we know in general, the church at large. Um, But I want to talk about this for a moment um, because some in some traditions or, you know, schools of thought would would define this idea that we've been predestined, um, would define this as like irresistible grace. Like it's a done deal. It's decided in eternity. It doesn't matter what you do or don't do. What's going to happen is going to happen. That's how it is, right? Um, Some would, would say that God chooses some people to go to heaven and God chooses some people to go to hell and that he chooses it, and it is what it is. I actually reject that, that thinking um, totally. Um, you can argue with me if you want in your head, not to me, but because um, <laughs> I'm too tired, okay? Um, <laughs> um, I, I don't believe Jesus only died for the elect, right? He died for everybody. You know, for God so loved the world that he gave his son, Right? Yes, God knows, of course, the future and who will or won't or whatever, but that doesn't change his posture. His posture is 100% towards every human, right? His posture is in pursuit towards every human. Um, I, you know, I, Romans 5, 6, you know, 6 and 8, if you know this, you see at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly, Very rarely will anybody die for a righteous person, though for a good person, somebody maybe will die for them. But God demonstrates his own love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. He died for sinners. He died for the ungodly. He died for those who hadn't received him, right? And so, um, you know, in, in the wrestle through this doctrine of election or predestination, Here's my only warning to you in this. I think it's really easy in in any kind of biblical concept is to jump on a bandwagon, you know, of extremes. And yet so many spiritual truths are just found in the middle. Tensions, right? So it's this concept of predestination yet free will. And and those things are tensions that hold each other. Um, You know, I heard somebody say, how do you know that you were chosen by God? Well, believe in Jesus and you'll prove that you were. We have a role to play, our choice. Will we choose him? T.L. Moody says, the whosoever wills are the elect. The whosoever won'ts are the non-elects. Or God wants all to believe. God chooses all. God loves all. God dreams for all. God predestines every person to be saved, but the devil also predestines every person to be damned, and you have the deciding vote. Like, it's God's heart towards everybody to be saved. Everybody. But you also have free will, and free will is powerful. And we also have the power to choose. So we're chosen. We're chosen by God. But for what? You know, not just so that one day we go to heaven, you know, fire insurance. It's so much bigger than that. It's so that we can live powerfully on this side of eternity as sons, as daughters. You were chosen not just to theologically check a box, but to to walk with him, to experience him to be transformed by him, to experience his love. It says he brought us into family. 
He didn't bring you into his corporation to do stuff for him. He brought you into his family, right? He brought you into relationship to live near him powerfully, to experience him, to be loved by him, to be wrapped in him, secure in him. It's not about our doing. It's about our being. And once we truly understand who we are as sons and daughters of God, powerful doing just will naturally flow out of our life. You see, when we really understand that we're chosen by God, it changes everything. It stops the wrestle inside of us. You know, um, recently I was, I was having this, um, I don't know, I just started feeling, had something going on. I was like, why am I feel, I feel weird. Like, what's happening? And I kind of got alone with the Lord, and he just began to talk to me about how there was this place in me um, well, actually, I found myself saying, I don't belong. I don't belong. And that's kind of, you know, in, in a lot of ways felt a little bit like a theme in my life. Um, I'm not going to go into a lot of my story, but um, being multicultural, having, growing up in a, in a um, being first-generation Mexican immigrant, and then my, my father is Caucasian, and then growing up in a, in a predominantly Mexican community, um, it was hard because I had... I was half white, so I didn't fully fit in with my Mexican friends. I was, you know, culturally much more Mexican, so I didn't really fit in with my white friends. I am nothing like, Kona always laughs, like, how did you come out of your family? I am nothing like anybody in my family. On either, my family's amazing, but I'm personality, look nothing. I look nothing. I, it's just strange. I'm like, I don't know where I came from. Um, so kind of always this, this sense of, like, odd one out, Right? And um, grew up in a really small town, definite odd one out. I was like, I'm out of here. I don't want to be here. I don't think like you guys think. I, you know, never felt like I belonged. And then, um, you know, God called me as a woman into ministry. Cool. <laughs> it is cool. But in terms of belonging, y'all better know who called you, right, <laughs> women, when you're called to ministry because there's not a seat at the table many times for women in ministry. And um, so it was one of those things where it's like, okay. And, and then as a person who, who is passionately feels called um, to, to justice and God's heart for justice in a culture and climate where, for whatever reason, Christ, you know, many people associate justice with politics versus the gospel. And so you know, even more of like, you don't belong, you know, and so just kind of feeling like, wow, in a lot of these places, kind of just this wrestle of, do I belong? And, um, and one day the Lord began to speak to me and just encourage me and, and challenge me. And um, he said, I, I want you to stop looking for a friend group or a, a, a group that you belong in. That's all great. But that's not where you belong. You've always and only belonged with me. You belong with me. You come from me. You're coming back to me. I am your family. You belong with me. It's my kingdom where you really, where we really get rooted in our belonging, right? And when we, when we really settle into that, of course, we're called to community and connect and all those things, and that's beautiful, but we're not showing up hoping to satisfy something because it's already been satisfied in God. So at the end of the day, it doesn't matter if you love me or reject me. I might be sad about it, but it doesn't matter because it's not going to shake who I am because I know that I'm chosen and I know that I belong, right? I know where I belong. And so... I think this is so powerful when we really begin to understand what it means that we're chosen and that we belong. Because here's the reality. The world would love to just try to lure us into, right, getting acceptance, belonging, fitting in, whatever it is. But that, I mean, if you've been alive for more than a decade or a minute, you realize those things change like the wind, right? It's constantly changing. The second you learn how to do your hair right, it changes. Anybody, you all might be too young for this. Anybody remember the like the wave up and then the wave down in Aquanet? No? You didn't grow up in a Chola neighborhood? How many, you know, the, you know the wave. Yeah, she did the wave. 
Yeah. She knows it. I mean, the second, right, it's like culture and things shift all the time. But really understanding, you know, that I don't, I don't draw my identity from those things. But when you really understand that you are chosen and that you are loved and there is purpose and destiny on your life, how can you live normal again? And some of us, maybe because we're weary or because we've just been a little bit beat up in this season, living normal, flying under the radar sounds really nice to you, but let me tell you, you will be sorely disappointed because you are not created to live like everybody else. You can't escape it, friend. You are chosen. You are marked by God. You are loved. You have great purpose and destiny in your life. You know, I think about Peter. I love Simon Peter. I relate to him a lot. Um, you know, but not only were we, we chosen, you know, chosen into God's family, but we were chosen for a great purpose on this earth. Now, remember this, right? Scripture tells us in, in the Psalms that while we were yet in our mother's womb, that God ordained every, every day ordained for, for us was written in his book, right? That God has written an incredible story about your life. Things he's dreaming about wanting to do through you. Things that only you can do. Because of your makeup, your personality, where you grew up, the experiences you've had, the way he's wired you. There are things on this planet only you can do. There are books only you can write. There are conversations only you can really have with certain people. There are songs and sounds that can only come from you. You are uniquely wired to do great things on this earth. And I've said this before, but the God of the universe who created everything did not write some lame, boring story for your life. It's impossible. He's good, right? He's wildly creative. So when you think about that, um, that God has an incredible purpose for us, this is where choice comes in as well. Because he wants to use us, and he's choosing to use us. He's choosing to partner with us. He's choosing you for great things, but is our choice engaged? You know, and, and Peter, um, in his life, if you remember, he's, he's fishing, and Jesus comes along, just gets in his boat. Like, what's up? Just gets in his boat, right? And he's like, push it out a little bit, and um, begins to preach to the crowd. And you have this moment where you have creator collaborating with creation. It, it, when you think about it, it's kind of wild. Jesus, who, can, who made the water, who can walk on the water, is asking for Peter's boat. Jesus, who could stand on the water, doesn't want to do that. He wants to get into Peter's boat to accomplish something. Right? He wants to partner with us. He wanted to use Peter's weakness and his passion in his life. He wants, wanted to do it with Peter, just like he wants to do it with us. Right? Why would the one who can walk on water want to use my boat? When God can do everything, when God can just show up and reveal himself to people, why, why should I ever share the gospel? We can easily get into this, and if we don't understand this power of choice, the power of being chosen, that God is choosing us. The reality is there were two boats on the shore that day, right? And if Peter would have said no, I think Jesus probably would have gotten in the other boat. He doesn't have to use us. He wants to use us. He wants to partner with us. He wants to walk with us. If that word use is, it feels weird for you, God doesn't, you guys know what I'm saying? Like, God doesn't want to use you. He wants to partner with you, collaborate with you. When I say use, that's what I'm meaning. Um, Luke 5, 3 says, he got into the boat belonging to Simon and asked him to put out a little from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the people. I love it. It says he asked him. He asked him, will you push out a little bit? You want to do this? You want to partner together? I wonder if God is asking us in this season. Hey, are, are we still like, because you can be a follower of Jesus. You, or, or, well, let me phrase that. You can be a Christian. You can be a theologically believing and then just kind of be like, Jesus, my, my boat's parked because I'm tired. 
I'm tired of that faith life. You know what I mean? Anybody relate? No? Y'all are too? Okay. Um, and he's, he's getting in our boats and he's saying, will you push out into the deep again? You want to partner with me for something great? You know, many of us, we look at the, the things, God, we have in our life, our boats, our careers, our skills, our, the things we've built, the, thing, you know, the things we've spent a lot of time developing and building, and we think it's our hustle and our ability to, to pull ourselves up from our bootstraps, and we think we're just a craftsman builder. And yet we forget who made the trees that we're building our boat with. Yet we forget who made the ocean we're out here trying to float our boat on. Yet we forget the one who literally wove every gill into the fish we're out here trying to catch. Right? Every good thing comes from him. Every good thing in your life comes from him. Even where you're at in your career, it comes from him. Right? Every good thing comes from him. But we have a choice. Are we going to let him in the boat? Um, and you know, the reality is when we do, he's a way better partner. Fishing gets a whole lot easier when the one who made the trees and the ocean and the fish is in your boat. Fishing's a whole lot easier. And you don't have to do it alone. And I love that, that Jesus chooses Peter. He also knew uh, the future. He knew who Peter was you know, his weaknesses. Um, If you remember in Luke 22, it says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you've turned away, strengthen your brothers. So Jesus knew that Simon was going to fall. And he also knew that Simon would come back. And yet Jesus still chose him in his weakness. He knew that he would betray him. And Jesus says, I still choose you. I want you. I love you. I love you despite your weakness. How many of us, when we look at our weakness, we want to hide from God? We want to disengage. We want to shut down. We we want to not show up to church. We want to, you know, disengage. And Jesus is once again telling us, my choice and love towards you has nothing to do with your behavior. So let me up in your boat. Life will be better, right? Right? God can reach the lost without us. God can do great things without us, but he wants to do it with you. Do you guys remember the story in Acts 8? I forgot about this story for a minute. Um, Philip and the Ethiopian. Um, Verse 26, it says, As for Philip, an angel of the Lord said to him, so an angel comes to Philip and tells him, Go south down the desert road that runs from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out. And he met the treasure of Ethiopia. Okay. A eunuch of great authority under the Candake, the queen of Ethiopia. The eunuch had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and he was now returning. Seated in his carriage, he was reading aloud from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The Holy Spirit said to Philip, go over and walk along beside the carriage. This story is so funny. Philip ran over, and he heard the man reading from the prophet Isaiah. And he said, he asked, do you understand what you're reading? The man replied, how can I unless somebody instructs me? Okay, time out. This man from Ethiopia has traveled all the way on pilgrimage to worship in Jerusalem, okay? He is worshiping somehow, probably because he's a foreign dignitary, because he's, you know, serves in the, in the queen's court. He is given this treasure, a handwritten scroll of the prophet Isaiah. Like, this is a treasure. He is given this treasure, and he's reading it, and not on his way home, you know, in old school 405. I don't know. He's on his way home in his chariot reading it. And an angel comes to Philip and says, go down that old desolate desert road. And Philip could have said, I'm tired. But yesterday was leg day, and I don't feel like doing that, right? It's hot. I don't want to. I have plans. He could have said a million things. But Philip obeys, and he goes, right? And so this man says, how can I unless somebody instructs me? 
And he urged Philip to come up into the carriage and to sit with him. And so the passage of scripture says that he was reading this. I'm going to skip over that because it says what he was reading. And in verse 34 it says, The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, was the prophet talking about himself or somebody else? So, beginning with the same scripture, Philip told him the good news about Jesus. As they rode along, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, there's some water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the carriage to stop, and they went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. Uh, perdón? I'm sorry, what? You snatch that boy right up and like gone. Like, wait, what? The eunuch never saw him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Meanwhile, Philip found himself further north at the town of Azotus. He preached the good news there and in every town along the way until he came to Caesarea. What? Dude, this story is crazy. This story is crazy. Philip woke up and was like having some tea and some bread. And Jesus was like, hey go down this road. He's like, really? So he obeys. He has this incredible, you know, gets to preach the gospel. This man gets saved, gets baptized. Oh, hey, by the way, just gets like totally transported somewhere else. And he's like, guess while I'm here, I'll preach, right? Like, what a day. What a day in the life of Philip, right? But you know what's interesting to me? It says that an angel of the Lord came to Philip and told him to go. If an angel of the Lord was going to make the trek from heaven, to come down and tell Philip to walk down that road, why didn't said angel just show up to the Ethiopian and tell him the gospel? I mean, same distance. Same ways time. Isn't that interesting? Because God doesn't want to do it without us. God wants to partner with you. And now, yes, God could have done that, and that man could have been saved and had an incredible experience, but now two people had an incredible day. Two people left the day rejoicing, wowing in amazement at who God is. Two people were impacted. Actually, many more. Because think about all the people that, you know, uh, Philip's free ride probably got saved after he went preaching in who knows where. Right? So when you think about it like this, when we surrender ourselves to God's choice towards us, when we surrender our choice towards God, our ability for encounter with God and our ability to impact the world is exponential. It's wildly exponential. What will we choose? Are we going to really let Jesus get in our boat? Will we respond to the tug of the Holy Spirit in our life? Because, friend, the reality is you have been chosen for a great purpose and destiny. I don't say that lightly. I know that can be like church lingo. This is the reality. You have been chosen by God to live powerfully. You hold the key of faith in your hand. You have been blessed in the heavenly realms with every blessing. You are loved and wanted and secure. He chooses you. He wants to partner with you. Just like he sent Philip, he wants to send you to do things that will make your heart come alive. Will we let him in our boat? You know, I think about Esther when Mordecai tells her, and she's facing this huge problem, and Mordecai tells her, how do you know, Esther, it wasn't for such a time as this that you were born, that you were placed where you are? How do you know that it isn't for such a time as this that you have been placed next to that cranky neighbor, that annoying coworker, that gardener that just kind of is so tender towards you? How do you know for such a time as this, right? I think so often we wait for these big magical God moments in our life when the heavens part and the angels come and, oh, like I've arrived. And I think so much of it is just the daily, Jesus, you can have my boat. Right now, when I'm tired and I just want to go home because I've been fishing all night and got nothing, oh, yes, Jesus, you can get in my boat. I think that's where the real power is. 
I think it's in those choices that are so life-changing. Jeremiah 1.5, I chose you before I formed you in the womb. I set you apart before you were born. Is, do you believe that truth about yourself? Would you say that about yourself? I'm set apart for God. I can't escape it. His mark of love is all over my life. I, I I'm chosen by God. I have purpose and destiny in my life. My life is too great just to be out here trying to live like everybody else. I am called. Do we believe that about ourselves? Because that's the truth. Are we going to live like orphans and beggars when we're royalty? You're not a dime a dozen. We're God's masterpiece. Hmm. I want to I want to um, pray this over us this morning. The end of that passage in Ephesians 1, um, I'm going to pray this in a moment. It's what Paul prayed over the church in Ephesus. But my prayer, church, for us is that we would get so rooted in this. Because I know that there's probably people in this room like me who maybe, especially after this pandemic and all your social circles are kind of weird, we were just talking about this with some friends yesterday. It's like, you know, you have your social circle and then everything changes so much during the pandemic and it got a lot smaller or just different. And it's like, uh, 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 you know, trying to figure out, do I want all those friends again? I miss some, but I don't know. That life was hard. You know, like everybody's in this wrestle right now in a lot of ways. At the same time, I think, I think a lot, you know, maybe there's people in this room who can relate to, I don't, I don't know that I always feel like I belong. I don't really feel like I belong in the church. I don't really feel like I belong in my industry. I don't really feel like I belong in my family. I don't really feel like I belong in this city. I don't really feel like I belong. We can do this all day long. Why? Because I know the enemy is a jerk, and he does this all the time, trying to tell us, you're not right, you're not good enough, you don't belong, nobody really likes you, you know, they're just pretending to like you. All the things. But what if we could get so set free from that because we get so rooted in the fact of, you know, I don't, and this, hear me with this, but it's like, I don't need your acceptance. I don't, I don't, I love you and I want to be around you, but I don't, I don't need to belong with you because I am, I am so rooted in who I belong to. I'm so confident in the reality that I have been chosen by God with great purpose and destiny in my life, Right? And that God is inviting me and wanting to partner with me. Listen to me. God is asking today, can I get in your boat? Because there are some fresh assignments for you. As I was praying for our community, I felt like the Lord was saying there's some fresh assignments for people in this room. It's not just what you've been doing in the past decade, the past couple years, the past six months. There are some fresh assignments, and God is saying, I choose you. And let me tell you, he doesn't come looking for the most qualified. He looks for the willing. Right? If he's called you, he's going to equip you with what you need. Look at history. It's always mind-blowing. You pick two? Really? Right? It's not, a, once again, it's not about our, our qualifications. It's about him. And so I want you to be just mindful of that this week that God is, is choosing us and inviting us to step into some things? And does he have our yes? Does he have our yes? I'm going to pray this over you, Ephesians 1, 18 through 23. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which his, he, he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, 
which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. So God, I pray that the eyes of our heart would be enlightened to know the wild hope you've called us to. I pray that you would open our eyes to understand how loved and chosen we are. I pray for every person who has been struggling with feeling like you are a disappointment to God. I break that lie off of you right now in Jesus' name. And I declare of you there has never, or anybody who's felt alone, like you didn't belong or you weren't wanted, I break that lie off and I declare this truth over you. There wasn't a moment in your existence that you were not chosen and loved and desired and thought after and dreamed of and passionately pursued. You belong and you are chosen as his son, as his daughter. And he has great purpose and destiny for your life, but he is looking for your yes. Because he's not going to to force you to love his son. God will not force us to love Jesus. He's not gonna command us, do this, or it's over for you. It's a choice. Just like I shared the story of of me having to choose Hona. God loves our choice when our choice is engaged. So, Father, I pray for all of us this morning for a fresh yes in our choice towards you. A fresh yes, God. For those, Lord, who have felt like, man, we have been fishing all night. I'm tired. It's feels like this is not working. I haven't been catching anything. I'm tired. I pray, God, that there would be courage to say yes again. And that as you get into our lives, as you get into um, just near us, God, I thank you that you are so with us, Lord, and that you guide us and direct us. I want to just take a minute, and if, as we're just in this place of prayer, I don't know where you guys are today. I think we're all probably in a lot of places, but for everybody watching online, I want to just take a moment. If you're like, man, I I don't know that my choice towards Jesus has been very engaged. Maybe you're kind of just floating or going through motion and, and it hasn't really felt like, yes, Jesus, you have chosen me, but I am choosing you. Not just, you know, oh, I'm a Christian. No, I'm talking about like the daily choice in my heart. And if if that's you, I want you just to take a moment and say, Jesus, you have my fresh yes. Jesus, you have my yes. I choose you. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for breaking me free from being a slave to sin, from everything that I've come out of. Thank you, Jesus. You have my fresh yes. And I also want to just take a moment, and if anybody's never made that commitment to follow Christ and you've never um, engaged your yes to him, I want to pray for you too. And if that's you and you're like, I, I want to say yes to Jesus. I want to follow him. I haven't done that. I haven't given my life to him, and I want to do that. Just lift your hand and let me know if that's you, and I want to pray with you. Is there anybody? Yeah. Okay. I'm going to just pray for us. Father, I pray for anybody, Lord, that's watching or that's here today, God, that is feeling... this pull, Lord, to surrender, to say yes to you. Jesus, we thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you choose us despite ourselves. And God, we ask that you would take our lives. We give you permission to lead us, to direct us. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins, Lord. And God, we say yes, a big fat yes to you today. 
have your way in our lives. God, we say yes to following you. Get in my boat, Jesus. I want to learn to live your way. I swing wide the door of my heart open to you. We love you and we thank you, Jesus. Speak your blessings over every person here. God, that you would expand them and bless them this week. I pray, Lord, Holy Spirit, that their, their spirits would be extra sensitive to the Holy Spirit's nudgings this week. Just like you nudged Philip, Lord, in that moment, Lord, I pray that when we come back next week, Lord, we would all come back with stories of how we said yes and, and obeyed and leaned into those nudgings, Lord. I thank you, Father, to speak your blessings over every person. In Jesus' name, amen.